Welcome to Tokyo. Uh, we've been here a few days already. We've done a lot of random things. Uh, the convenience store game here is really next level. Um, if you are familiar with things like 7-Eleven, the 7-Elevens here are actually really good. There's also a convenience store brand called Lawson's, which I think started in like Ohio and somehow ended up here with like thousands and thousands of stores. And their egg sandwiches are very, very delicious and surprisingly good for a convenience store item. Uh, Marshall, who is here doing some videos, it's, I'm here with Marshall and Blaine, his brother. Um, Marshall is very addicted to, uh, it's called Coolish, and it is soft serve ice cream in a bag, kind of like a Capri Sun style bag, if you're familiar with that at all. Um, it's very, very tasty. And last year when Marshall and I were here, this is an addiction that's been going on for several years now. Um, when we were here last September, we noticed that it was pretty much in every store, so we didn't really have to stop in to every convenience store that you pass. And if, you, uh, if you've been here, you know that there's like pretty much two convenience stores on every block. Uh, so we would stop in and get one every now and then last year, and I thought it was really funny, and I made a beautiful little compilation video for him. Uh, and then this year, it seems to be a little bit more rare. So um, I feel like that's like feeding the addiction even more, that now we have to stop everywhere to make sure that um, we get the optimal... Uh, coolish supply to Marshall. Um, also, it's like, it. I guess like Japan in general, um, I guess this kind of speaks to scarcity, which is something that I talk about if you've, um, if you've purchased any of my courses or uh, been part of the Patreon page for a little while now. Uh, and Japan really relies on scarcity and limited time offers. So if you find something that's like really, really delicious, chances are it's a limited time offer and it's going to go away. Um, so you have to like, get as much of it as you can really fast. Um, if you decide that you like something, last year they did, uh, it was a coffee Coke, which sounds really weird and disgusting. Um, and it's in kind of like a tiny little um, like 200 milliliter can. And it sounds really, really gross, but it was actually really, really good. Um, we essentially like the vending machine culture here is also kind of um, next level that there's vending machines literally everywhere and you have your Suica card or your Passimo card and you just touch it to the machine and you just like whatever you want, um, it'll give to you. So uh, Blaine, Marshall's brother, has been our, our guide to exploring new and interesting vending items because you don't really know what you're going to get because there is a couple words of English usually on it. So it'll tell you if it's like water or natural water um, or if it's like Coke, you can obviously recognize that. But a lot of the items are very not familiar to us. So um, we're just kind of ordering a little bit of everything and seeing what's good and taking photos of it to remember it. Um, and there's also some strange items in the vending machines too that like in the Coca-Cola machine, everything's kind of split halfway. So it's like your cold items are up top and they'll all have like little blue buttons and then your hot items all have red buttons. And some of the hot items are like coffees and regular things. And then some of them are just like cans of creamed corn um, or like beans. It's a uh, it's it's a very interesting. If you've never been, if you've never considered coming to Tokyo, I I highly recommend it. It's uh it's for sure one of my favorite cities in the world. It's like it's very an interesting place to come. Also, the photographic opportunities here there are quite a lot. If you're into cityscape photography, which is what we're actually going to be talking a little bit about today. Um, so the lenses, uh, I guess, like the way that this project came about was. The reason we're here is because of a failed project that we booked and we had the flights booked, so we figured we would come anyways. Um, so we're kind of filming just general other content for use um, rather than the original project that we were doing. And by coming over here with somebody, it makes my production, I guess, a lot easier. So when I am alone in a place, which is how I usually um, started doing a photographer in, so a photographer in kind of began um, in its season one infinite infancy as... Um, just like that I would be in a place for another shoot and I would just film like a little travel um, like segment, like 10 minutes or whatever, about the things that you could do as a photographer if you ended up in that spot. Um, that was all self-filmed. I filmed it pretty much entirely on a Nikon D5500 that had the front flip screen and the kit lens that it came with. So the first season of A Photographer In is all from that, with the exception, I think, of the season finale, which is, I think, the Porsche trip across America. Um, and then when I got to that Porsche trip across America, I was filming other people doing things rather than filming myself. Um, so at that point, I actually moved to just filming pretty much on a 35 millimeter lens, uh, which is, I guess, like the thing that I want to talk a little bit about today and how powerful that single lens is. So I filmed that entire trip on the 35 Tamron, which is a great lens. And here this trip, uh, because I do have somebody else to film content of me, uh, 
Marshall's doing that with his super wide or uh, 24 to 70 Tamron, um, I am pretty much entirely on my 35. The lenses that I brought with me uh, are the, I have the, uh, the Canon R, so I have a 35 RF, which is the new kind of macro 35 um, that they, that they put out that you're able to purchase now, I think officially. Uh, it was, it's kind of hard to find because it's, um, I guess like the Canon R, everything that's kind of going on with the camera, a lot of bad reviews, I think overall. So a lot of camera shops think that there's a very low demand because I don't know, all the influencers out there saying that it's not the greatest camera system. Um, and it's not a reason to stay with Canon or it's not a reason to switch to Canon or not even worth the like $3,000 Canadian, 2,500 us that it actually costs. Uh, so in that case, um, I guess it makes sense that there's really a low demand on products, so it's not getting shipped. But uh, the 35 that is out, I really, really love a lot. So I brought the 35 and I brought the 50, the old 50 one, two with the adapter um, to go in the Canon R. And I so far haven't used the 50. We used the 50 for, um, Marshall took some photos of me dressed up as a tennis player yesterday. Um, but the 35 has been on my camera whenever we go out into the world and do things. And I absolutely love that focal length for travel photography. Um, I also really enjoy it a little bit wider too, um, like a 28 or even like a 30, if you can find a 30. Um, those are kind of like, I feel like that is my good travel size. Um, the thing that I like the most, I guess, also is that it really does remove a lot of the size of the camera as well if you're shooting a 35 prime. Um, I also like for photographs of people that if you're traveling with people that you can actually get kind of that nice depth of field that not, everything's not going to feel like it was photographed with a kit lens um, at like f5.6 that you can get that nice one, 1 1.8 nice uh, soft background blur. Um, so I think that's the reason that I am I guess the most passionate about bringing a 35 with me whenever I come on a trip like this. If I was doing video of myself doing things uh, usually that is when I rely on the super wide on my camera as well. And right now there's no great option for a Canon R, uh, super wide, but, uh, in the past I've used the Tamron 10 to 24. I think it's like an F 3.5 to four or five or five, six or something like that. And that is another great lens, but I find that my, the images that I get, I just don't really love, um, super wide images. Like, so in, in my actual camera, when I'm taking the images, I'm always really, really stoked on them. And I think that they're amazing and that you can get so much like into like this frame. And especially if you're up, up high on buildings, um, I guess like also, uh, if you, if you are coming to Tokyo, you can come up the park high at Tokyo, which is where I'm staying, uh, this week. And all the lobby is like a 360 view of Tokyo. And it's probably one of the best, um, the best surprise spots in the city to come up. Uh, and if you come up at like six in the morning or uh, 645, which is sunrise now, there's pretty much no staff at all kind of in the main level. So you have some time that if you actually want to set up, um, maybe bring a small tripod so it's not a complete giveaway. Uh, but you're able to actually photograph over sunset or sunrise, which is, um, I guess, like a, a time of day that you couldn't really get up any other building um, if you're not staying in a hotel or whatever there. Um, the other, I guess, like good building to get up as well as the government center, which is um, like a few blocks away from the Park Hyatt. But I think it's easier at Park Hyatt. You just kind of like take the elevator up and you're here. Um, once you actually find the entrance, which is actually a little bit challenging. Um, with the government center, it's like, it's. I think it's free, but you it's more of kind of an observation deck for tourists. So there's a lot more people around um, kind of all taking photos. And it's. Uh, I think it's a better situation here. Um, if you've watched the movie Lost in Translation, you've the entire movie happens within this hotel, so you've probably seen a lot of the views of it, and a lot will look pretty familiar to you. Um, I don't love the concept of um, like going up tall buildings for photography when in a new place. Uh, I I know that that might seem like the obvious answer to like go up Tokyo the Sky Tree or to go up Tokyo Tower to get like those like I guess like higher shots. I guess Tokyo Tower is not really that tall. Um, but like to go up the sky tree and to be like in the tallest building in the entire city and take photos from up there. Um, well, that's like nice and all. Um, I think it's a better experience for like us as actual humans to see that. I don't think it makes for the best images. I think that the best images come from being a little bit more kind of embedded in the city um, so that you can have close ups of things rather than just like being in the tallest place. Everything looks a little bit too flat. So I would rather be kind of on the, the middle of the floor or maybe just like at the at the tips of all the other buildings, um, which if you come up the Park Hyatt or the Government Center, you're kind of in that exact spot where you do feel like you're actually in the city and you're not just like in a helicopter above. Um, helicopter above is good for one photo, but I think that you can frame a lot more from kind of a 360 view 
within the city level, um, which is pretty cool. You can also see Mount Fuji a lot of the time from taller buildings in Tokyo as well. Um, so maybe bring a longer lens than a 50 if you are interested in that. Um, it's probably also just worth the day trip out there. So the 35 millimeter lens is my go-to unless I have to be filming myself. Uh, I have always kind of struggled with the idea of bringing a kit lens. I don't love just generally having a kit lens for photography and that means for weddings and that means also for travel. For travel videos, it is useful. Uh, it is kind of the easiest, I guess, the easiest thing to use, which maybe um, if you're just kind of traveling with your family, maybe that is what you want. Uh, but I think that I get a lot better images and I think a lot more consciously about creating those images if I'm using a 35. And like absolute worst case, if you're somewhere like really, really beautiful and you want that wide shot, you just do a panorama and just stitch it all together in Photoshop or Lightroom afterwards. Um, so that's kind of how I save it. And it also makes you um, a lot more conscious about like, is this a good wide shot? Is it worth taking all the images and then po uh, processing it in post to actually make it stitch together into this wide shot? Um, and if you say yes and you shoot it, then you're probably only going to be shooting a few of those rather than overshooting um, if you did have a wider lens. So those are my thoughts. If you're traveling, um, bring a 35, it's nice and small. Uh, the Tamron 35 is great. The new Canon RF is really great. Uh, beyond that, I feel like those are kind of the best, uh, the best 35s that I, that I like to use often because they do have stabilization in them, which is um, something that's important to me because I will be shooting some video with it as well while I'm here. And uh, you can also, uh, depending on your camera system, with a 35, if you are shooting video, you can crop into like DX mode or crop mode um, within your camera to get a little bit more reach out of the lens. You can't go wider, but you can go um, a little bit more zoomed, uh, which is super useful, I think, to just get a couple different looking shots um, from the same exact spot. Um, the other good thing, I guess, about shooting with a smaller camera is that people just don't assume you're professional. So even if you're somewhere where maybe security, um, I haven't run into this issue in Tokyo at all, but like downtown Toronto, um, you'll find this happens a lot that if you're shooting professionally somewhere, security will come and tell you to, to move along. Um, if you're shooting with a smaller camera, typically uh, they're going to be a little bit more lenient on you because you just look like a tourist, especially if you look kind of a little bit out of place like you do in Tokyo. Um, they are very aware that you're a tourist and also like it's not a problem usually for, um, for taking photos. And uh, the other good thing is just like general size that you can bring a small, uh, I have like a small Patagonia kind of over the shoulder bag that I stole from Lindsay. And you can bring that and your camera can fit in there comfortably as well as like a, a battery charger for your phone um, or whatever else you need. And you don't have to carry around like a, big backpack everywhere. Um, and I'm really kind of an advocate on being kind of lightweight and um, easy to move around. And the less I can bring, the better. And I don't feel like I miss a whole lot by just bringing a 35. Obviously, if I, I know I'm going somewhere that's going to be like uh, like mountains or just somewhere that the landscapes are going to be a lot bigger. Um, I guess this might also be kind of a counterintuitive thing that the bigger the landscape I'm seeing, usually the longer the focal length I'm at. So if I'm, sh if I'm in the mountains, I'm typically probably shooting like uh, either like my 58 or 85 or 7200. Um, and I find that like that 7200 focal range is actually kind of my favorite for um, mountains and just like bigger landscapes um, rather than going wide because if you're shooting wide you're just getting so much foreground and unless there's something really really interesting in the foreground um, it's just gonna uh, kind of overweight the image and even by like if you are out, like for instance you're at a beautiful lake with mountains in the background um, to make the mountains just appear bigger I would rather shoot that scene at like 85 or even at 200 if I have the space to do that and just move back rather than putting my camera right on the lake and taking the photo, be like as far away from the lake as I can get so that I can get um, the mountains to be a little bit bigger kind of just just due to perspective and whatnot. Um, so those are my, my quick, uh, I guess, travel photography advices uh, as well as the lens that I'm using the most here. So um, yeah, thanks for joining me today. I will see you tomorrow from Tokyo again, and I will let you know how many egg sandwiches that I consumed. Um, I won't do that. Well, maybe I'll do that. I don't know. We'll see you tomorrow. Back to the awkward ending. See you tomorrow.